Hi, and welcome to the Days Gone podcast. I'm Claire Weaver, a screenwriter, author, and Days Gone fan, and this podcast is a place to discuss the game in all its glory, share my opinions, both popular and unpopular, and listen to me fangirl over one of the best games ever made. There will be spoilers ahead, so continue at your own risk. Welcome to the Freak Show. A couple reminders before we get started today. Every morning at 7.30am Pacific Time, you can watch me livestream my Survival 2 Fresh Start playthrough. I take on hordes, talk shit about rippers, and lay waste to ambush camps all before I've had my morning cup of coffee. You can find me on my YouTube channel, just search for Days Gone Podcast. And on Tuesdays, I join Spornicus Rex on his YouTube channel for a collaborative livestream playthrough of Days Gone. He goes into advanced gameplay tactics and strategy, and I discuss the story, characters, and all the amazing details of the game. You can find us live on the Spornicus Rex YouTube channel every Tuesday at 6pm Pacific. Welcome back to part two of my conversation with mental health professional Zach Geyser. Last week we talked about Deacon and Boozer, and now we're going to break down the rest of the characters and discuss our own chances of survival in a Days Gone world. Let's move on to Sarah. So I really want to talk about her because we're, we're kind of missing part of her story because uh, we don't see what she does for the past two years. We only meet her much later in the game. We have to infer so much. But she is obviously a very different person from who mm. we see in the flashbacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, when we meet her again, what she's done is she's intellectualized the whole freaker outbreak by sinking into her work, right? She's become a workaholic. Uh, she literally wants to discover what makes Freakers tick and see if she can undo this. And I think this is very symbolic for wanting to take back control of her life. Right. Um, it's not just her life that she's lost, but her husband as well, for whom she's sacrificed a, a great deal of her life before that, even to get um, into a, a marriage with Deacon. Mm -hmm. I believe that she really loved her life with Deacon before the Freakers came. Uh, and she sacrificed, like I said, a lot to make that a reality. So it's understandable that she would try to find a way to reverse the infection or at least convince herself that that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to explain what you said about sacrificing a lot of her life to be with Deacon. Um, it, it's mentioned in the wedding scene, the wedding flashback. Yeah, I think, that's what I, was I think of. some people kind of forget this or, or maybe just don't pick up on it, but she, she was disowned by her yep. family. She was yep. from a, you know, sort of nice middle class family and they basically said, you know, if you marry this biker boy, well, you're dead to us. So she yeah. she gave up her family. And we don't really know what kind of family she had or, you know, does she have siblings? Does she obviously she has parents like that what what is she giving up to be with Deacon? Uh, whatever it was, it was a lot. And she gave that up. Her love for Deacon was greater than her love for her family. And we see how that very risky choice uh, plays out right in the future uh, with the potential loss that she believes that he's dead. Yeah. Um, it's changed her as a person. We see that she's probably experienced some, some trauma there. I mean, I, I don't want to be cliche, but sometimes you've heard that phrase um, without great risk, like you forego great reward, right? I think she did take a great risk to be with him mm -hmm. and it was a great reward. Um, but with the idea of that, of him disappearing or dying, she's left with very little left over. So I think with Sarah, I think the big story arc for her is about um, abandonment. It starts by narrating this abandonment with good intentions, but her husband leaves her on that helicopter with O'Brien, right? Right. She She's injured, physically uh, vulnerable, and possibly emotionally vulnerable as we you know, later see that nobody, like you said, nobody from her family wanted anything to do with her marriage to Deacon. So they were pretty isolated as a couple, except for Boozer. Because um, I think, didn't the MC kick Deacon out for marrying her as well? Um, they they didn't kick him out. This one's kind of a little bit wonky in the game because he went nomad. He stepped back so that he could spend more time with her. Okay. But when they got married, no one from the MC except for Boozer showed up. So he is right. still in the MC. They didn't disown him. He's still, you know, part of the club. But he just wasn't really associated with that chapter so much that mm -hmm. they didn't mm -hmm. show up, which seems kind of like an abandonment. It seems like there's the game maybe, I don't know how true to life that would be because he is still a Swarno member. He does still wear the colors. So they should have been there. 
we're not really given a reason why they don't show up. Yeah, well, both of them. Maybe that's something that they see in each other. Is they're, they've both dealt with loss in their personal lives, but it brings them together. Yeah, they both sacrificed their previous lives to be with each other. Yeah. It's funny you mention abandonment. You hit the nail on the fucking head with Sarah's issue is all about abandonment because when Deacon, in the flashback, when Deacon proposes to her, she says, mm-hmm. promise me something. Promise you'll never leave me. Right. And we see that he had to break that promise, which makes it so impactful. And just, you know, I think she understands that he did what he did for her safety. But, I mean, you're in a marriage. I'm in a marriage. We know that sometimes we don't give a shit about our safety. We would rather forego that in order to stay with the person that we love. Right. And, it, I mean, he could have gotten the chopper with her. He, he air quotes, abandoned her to help Boozer. And in theory, he could have, I mean, I've said this before in the podcast, like, he could have put Sarah and Boozer, the two injured parties, on the chopper and been like, I'll find my own way out. Or, I mean, he's got a gun. He could have just put a gun to O'Brien's head and said, we're all three getting on the chopper. You say you got room for two? Yeah. Fuck you. We're all three getting on. What are you yeah. going to do? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, I talked to Jim Perry, uh, the guy who played Boozer, uh, the actor mm-hmm. behind Boozer, and he he confirmed that yeah, there's no way that Boozer would have gotten the chopper and left Deacon behind, and there's no way right, that Deacon would have left Boozer behind. Like they are fucking brothers. Their bond is stronger than Deacon and Sarah's. But it's interesting that you know he he promised to never leave her, and yet he put her on the chopper and said, oh, "I'll catch you later." So yeah, abandonment issues is <laughs> definitely something. Yeah, it's a little bit of a betrayal. With. Yeah, yeah, there's a betrayal there understandable but still a little bit of a betrayal for sure um you'd mentioned lisa earlier um i think we can kind of quickly say that's the most obvious case of developmental and attachment trauma Mm -hmm. Uh, when we meet her she seems like a very sheltered girl and very mentally and emotionally immature even for her age right uh she's very naive and it takes a lot of effort to just pry her out of her bedroom yeah and she's like talking about her mom and her trophy and all of that and it's like she's just almost unaware of what's happening in a way or like unwilling to see the world around her i think she's coping with it just by putting herself in the past uh she's mentally reverted back to a safer place or regressed Mm -hmm. um because yeah she has no chance of surviving on her own in in the way the world is now uh her joining the rippers in my mind was again a way for her to make sense of her new world Um, right it's complete chaos with a capital c Mm-hmm. Right, she's kind of. It makes it seem like she's embracing it, but I almost think that she's succumbing to it. Like it's overwhelming for her. She's she's losing herself in the madness of the world. I think it's a miracle that Deacon finds her because that puts a little chip in that armor. It's a little, even though he's betrayed her by placing her with Tucker, he's at least a familiar face. It's it's almost like a little thread of light coming through in utter darkness. Yeah, because she does, she comes across as being kind of naive and easily led in a way. And I always, I've talked before about how I see Lisa's story as being one of finding her strength. So she Mm -hmm. is, you know, taken by by Deacon to Tuck's camp where she's forced to work. And then she kind of has the wherewithal to try to get away from that, but she falls in with the Rippers and then she becomes uh, indoctrinated by them. But at a certain point she decides, no, I'm... I'm not one of these assholes. And she lets, Mm -hmm. she helps Deacon escape. In fact, she rescues him. He would not escape without Lisa. And then you don't see her again until after the credits at the end of the game, where she shows up now a drifter like Deacon, tough as nails, you know, has a bag full of ears she wants to turn (laughs) in, doesn't want to live in a camp, wants to go her own way. And it's like, okay, maybe she's gone a little too far into this new personality. And she's like pushing too hard to be this badass fucking drifter. No one fucks with Lisa. But at least it's she seems strong. And she seems to be tough and badass in a way that Deacon wasn't. She she doesn't let her damage control her. She's taken charge of it to make it part of herself and use it kind of as fuel. Absolutely. Um, she's what I would say in the clinical sense is she's accommodating. Uh, she's changing how she sees herself in order to mesh with the world around her. Mm. Um, You know, she's, she's realized she's coming to terms with 
the trophy winning I don't remember what sport it was was it gymnastics or yeah gymnastics mm-hmm. that that doesn't really have a place in this world anymore and she kind of has to grow past that I'm not saying forget it right she can still have that life in the uh, those memories of her past life but she needs to to learn to toughen up um, just because that's what the world is demanding of her yeah I was gonna say let's talk about the rippers for a second uh and the Carlos slash Jesse, the idea of him forgetting his identity or, or striving to forget his identity and creating a whole cult about forgetting your identity uh, and how interesting it is when you <laughs> look at what led him to that point is having his mongrel's identity taken from him when he was kicked out of the right. MC and had his back tattoo burned off, had his colors taken away. So he had that forced upon him. Like, oh, you identify as a mongrel, fuck you, we're taking that from you. And then he creates this whole cult of, hey, everyone, we should all forget who we are. Oh, well, except for me, I get to keep my name and uh, this grudge that I have. (laughs) And that's going to be what destroys all of us. But everyone else, forget who you are, revel in being lost and like the freaks. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes I think as an outsider, it's so much easier to see through the bull crap that people try to sell to themselves. Mm. Um, but I, I have to imagine that his followers, the other rippers aren't keen to this, that they're just going along with it and they do believe it with as much of their, much of themselves as they can. But when I, when, when I first came across um, Jesse's story as it's revealed, I immediately thought of him as the, the flip, side of the coin compared to to boozer um that he was another former mc brother Mm -hmm. but he has lost his identity and there's no redeeming arc for him and he's again you know like lisa did he he began accommodating to match his reality but it was also a survival strategy we see what kept boozer alive is is his relationship with deacon right deacon goes after him he tries to save him Again, he he finds his dog, which is which is a good part of the game. He has something that anchors him back into reality. Mm. Uh, I don't think Jesse had that. I think he very. I would imagine after getting kicked out of the MC, he probably became depressed. He didn't know necessarily who he was anymore, like on the outside or where he fit into the world. He didn't have his family. If I can say the MC served that role as his family, mm-hmm. and so he created his own family i would imagine for him he saw this freaker outbreak as a blessing right it gave him a new opportunity to reinvent himself and like you said so that he could forget about the past he didn't have to he didn't have to deal with those pains of knowing that he let down his brothers in the mc right and also but it's interesting that he still harbors all the anger and he doesn't blame himself he doesn't see it as having let down his brothers. He sees it as my brothers, they hurt me by kicking me out and taking my identity. Yeah, well, we we know that he's, (laughs) I think, a little childish in that way. I mean, he has to take responsibility for what he did. Obviously, the MC has their rules and uh, regulations. So if he sees himself as bigger than that, I don't know that he really fit in anyway. True. Yeah. I mean, you definitely get the impression that he wasn't, they wouldn't have done that or he wouldn't have done whatever led to him being kicked out, uh, which from from certain things I've read, it, it, it's implied that he killed someone in the MC, uh, perhaps as part of some sort of drug deal or something, something that he was doing that was not under the purview of the MC. He either murdered or had got killed a brother, which is a fucking terrible crime uh, against your your club, your brotherhood. So it's like, yeah, you deserve to get kicked out. But he doesn't see it that way. Yeah, obviously the MC was important to him. Um, I think we do this all the time, right? We we tend to hurt the ones we love, right? I think we've all heard that phrase before. Yeah. And you know, I don't have an answer for that definitively. Um, I think sometimes we get lost in balancing our egotistical wants with what's good for the group or what's better for the relationship. Yeah, the narrative that we tell ourselves, the justifications for our actions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't strike me as a very clever guy. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. Not at all. Um, so it's good to put an end to him. Yeah. 
Um, one of the other characters, just briefly, I know Wade is a, a significant character in the game. I know he doesn't last <laughs> too long, but he definitely stands out from everybody else, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And we're not really sure of his backstory, but we quickly uh, see just how he has survived. And we can imagine what other tactics and shenanigans he's pulled off to keep his mouth fed. Um, I don't think we necessarily get details on his drug of choice, but going back to the notion that like our trauma history is written in our body. I would imagine he is into downers and other substances that allow him to dive deeply into escapism. Mm. And I don't, I don't know that we can really blame him for wanting that. If, if everything's gone to shit and he doesn't have any connections, you know, it's like kill or be killed. And I think he's just trying to find another way to cope with all that, right. um, that pain and turmoil inside of him. Yeah. And I, I genuinely believe that he didn't want to to kill anybody in the camp. I think that that kind of impulsively happened because he was afraid. I don't know. Yeah, he's a very divisive character. A lot of people are like, fuck that guy, he killed the doc. I fall on the side kind of like you of like, well, I mean, obviously, yeah, kind of fuck that guy, he killed the doc. But right. there is a justification for it. In Not justification, that's the wrong term. But there is a, he he didn't want to do it. He still right. did it, but he didn't want to. Yeah, it's it's like it's not okay what you did, but I understand why you did it. I understand that the the accident happened. The accident right. being he slit someone's throat. Mm, he still <laughs> did that. It's not exactly an accident, but I do understand that he was under. Uh, he was in the throes of his addiction. Sure. And sure. not to, it's it's that line. It's like how do you how do you say you know, how do you justify someone's actions if you know if they have a reason why they did something? Uh, why am I defending Wade? You know, it's like he he's a drug addict who murders someone just to get opiates. Uh, yeah, totally fuck that guy. But I think because we're given so much of a reason to like him through the mm-hmm. game, you know, we are given so mm-hmm. many opportunities to find him amusing and find him likable and empathize with him and and sort of see a little bit of ourselves in him he's this guy who really doesn't fit into this world and and we're kind of all thinking the same thing like shit i'm not i'm not a tough guy i don't know if i'd survive in this world and here's wade who is not a tough guy at all how the fuck did he survive but cool he did and then oh shit he killed the doc to get drugs oh god uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> Fuck, I liked him, and now I don't know how to feel about that. It creates a lot of internal conflict for me. Of like, I do keep kind of justifying it, even though he's a murderer. He's a drug addict and a murderer, and yet I still like him. So I don't think that this is what you believe about him necessarily, but you did refer to him as a drug addict, and that's a very big label. That I mean, people get labeled that and call that all the time in our in our world. But I think when we are able to label someone, say, you are a drug addict, you are an alcoholic, we're writing them off as that one-dimensional character, right? And it's mm-hmm. easier for us to shut off that empathy and just say, fuck them. Like, get them out of our society, kill them off, whatever. When in reality, I don't think anybody is that simple. I think right. if we allow that empathetic connection and that relationship um, to exist, we'll find that you know, they were a child once they, they meant to do well. Um, it's, this world's not an easy place. And sometimes it it takes a bigger toll on some of us than others. uh, If I can say that. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's absolutely spot on. I mean, like you say, he, he was a child once he was somebody's son, maybe Mm -hmm. someone's brother, maybe someone's boyfriend. Uh, you know, he's, he's a likable guy who means well, he even says in the dialogue, like, I didn't mean to kill him. Yeah, yeah. So to just define the entire person by one action yeah, is, uh, I don't think, doing him justice. No, I think this game plays a lot on those blurred lines, right, between what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. Uh, is this person a good person? Is this person a bad person? Um, I think it's all a spectrum. I don't know that there is a all good person or all bad person. And I think that's very relatable. I think that's why we can relate to the characters on such a deep level. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would we do in those situations, in their shoes? I don't know, right? Uh, could I do it any 
better. I don't like what they did, but I don't know that I have a better option. Right. Um, I think people see themselves in the characters um, and, and we see the, the stuff that the characters go through. And sometimes that can cause us, at least for me, had me reflect on where I am at. How are my relationships doing? Right. How, how am I holding up yeah. <laughs> in my, in my life? Yeah. Um, so I hope that the, if people start to question that they, they have some introspection on themselves, that yeah. they're not afraid to, to talk to other people about that, that they're not, um, so timid or shy that they can't reach out to a friend and just check in and let them know when they're not feeling their best selves. Uh, I think that there are, you know, therapists in the world for a reason. There are people whose personalities align or career choice is to put themselves in in a position of safe harbor. We exist because we ourselves have needed that, likely. If I can speak and from my own experience, I've seen therapists before. I've needed that. It's been a help. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would hope that other players who have played this game and they've almost lived vicariously through the characters uh, are able to to find that strength to to build a good relationship with a therapist or a counselor or even just a close friend, right? Which is different, but that can be therapeutic. It can have benefits as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to one thing you said about... um the characters uh, being on a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the perfect introduction to my favorite character. I know you uh, you brought it up before we started <laughs> recording about maybe we touch a little bit on, on Schizo and where he fits in this conversation. Uh, what thoughts do you have on him? <laughs> well, I was going to say, you tell me, does he have a daddy complex or what's going on with him? <laughs> Oh, Schizo. Uh, What complex doesn't he have? Um, (laughs) I mean, it's definitely apparent, I think, in the game that he he had a good moment in his life when he was spoiled. Mm -hmm. And he never really got past that, even when things started to go bad. And there's a a big debate uh, among fans and players of the game uh, as to whether or not Schizo was ever a gangbanger. Jason Spizak, who played Schizo, said that he was, but a lot of evidence in the game and in the art book says that he wasn't, uh, Mm -hmm. but he plays it like he he was. He pretends that he was a gangbanger. I I don't know. I like to think that he was because there are certain things that he is very good at, certain skills he has that that seem practiced. They don't seem uh-huh. like someone who just, you know, was a bit manipulative in his job at his daddy's accounting firm. Uh, <laughs> you know, he he actually seems like he has played people in dangerous situations that could get him killed. He knows exactly how far to push and exactly what he can get away with. Um, so I think that he he has had a tough life. I think he had a a life. I mean, we find that little collectible that shows that he was maybe raised by his grandparents or his grandparents were supportive figures in his life. So my kind of headcanon is that his grandparents were like doted on him and spoiled him and, and basically gave him like an ego and, and treated him like a, you know, sort of child who could do no wrong. But then something happened and he, you know, got into gang banging or, or Mm -hmm. something life on the street, some, you know, tough kind of environment where he was able to hone that skill of being a a manipulative asshole who always comes out on top. If I had to summarize Schizo in a word, I I think it would be egotistical. Mm. Uh, But I do think he's, he's actually a pretty intelligent character in the game. Yes. Um, but like you said, he uses that intelligence to manipulate others for his own gain, obviously. I mean, they, they spell that out for us as we play through. Um, he even dumbs down his intelligence purposefully. You see uh-huh, him do it, where uh-huh. he'll speak at a certain level. So it's uh-huh. kind of like non-threatening. Right. But you know his brain is switched on and, and working. And he, he's, <laughs> he's playing chess in his head while he's, you know, saying, you know, anti whatever the fucks when he means antibiotics um, right, and like trying right. to be kind of like, oh, I'm just, uh, you know, I can't even finish a sentence without making funny hand gestures and little sound effects and things like that. Like, no, he's, he knows exactly what he's doing. I think Schizo is compensating a lot for something. We don't quite know what that is, but yeah, there, there's an emptiness, I think, that he's trying to fill mm-hmm. um, through, through power. 
and recognition. I think he definitely wants to be validated and wants to be respected. Um, but I think he confuses respect with fear a little bit because I think more people probably just fear him than respect right. him. Right, right. That is actually a really astute way of putting it, that he doesn't really understand the distinction between the two. Yeah, which is maybe fairly common in gang-type structures. I don't know, I've never been in one, but uh, <laughs> from all the portrayals that I've seen in, in media, it seems to that's a common, common yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean, they. it seems like they, they would be pretty synonymous in those kinds of environments, whereas really they, they technically are not. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you a question, Claire, if I can. Yeah, of course. How well do you think you would do holding it together in the midst of a societal oh collapse? Oh my god, and, what a question. <laughs> involving freakers and cults and maybe secret government agencies. Holy <laughs> shit. Um, that is actually a really good, good question. Thank you for asking me that. Yeah. I think my honest answer is I think I do really well and really poorly. Yeah, good answer. I think I would do really poorly at the actual skills of surviving, killing people. Maybe I'd be okay with that if they were threatening me. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I could take care of myself. But, you know, I have no <laughs> – like, morally, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But, like, I don't have firearm experience. So, I mean, that's probably just going to get me killed right there. Um <laughs> You know, I I don't really have survival skills. I like to think I do. I know how to start a fire, but nice. I'm also terrified of zombies and dead bodies and things like that. So I don't know if I'd be really very good. I know the freaks are not zombies, but essentially right. in that kind of world, I don't know how well I do with the, with the external world. Um, <laughs> internally, I'm one of those people, like the pandemic didn't really bother me. The last yeah. couple of years, like I'm an introvert, so yeah. if everybody went away, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's kind of okay. I don't I don't mind so much. Um, I I've been asked before which camp I would join, well, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I I would be in an ambush camp, um, because not because I want to be a bad guy who ambushes people, <laughs> but honestly, the the security is really good. And uh, just joining a small band of people ah. who are just like smart and armed and, and you know, uh, occupy one small region, mm. that makes sense, at least in the short term. But I'm also a little bit of an idealist. I am an Iron Mike, that I would have grand yeah. ideas of rebuilding the future. And I, I, yeah. I just don't know if that would go well for me. As, as you've talked about... Um... Lost Lake is quite a bit exposed, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Their their strength and their numbers and just how solid they they appear to be, uh, but but there's a bit of vulnerability. And if you're in an ambush camp, you could be a little more tactical and off the map. Mm. Um, also, they have the bunkers. Secretive. I mean, the bunkers <laughs> are like like just be in the bunker. That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> until you until you get hungry, right? Well, yeah, but like stock it up. I mean, those bunkers are not well stocked. But I would be the one who'd be like, okay, guys, you stand out there and guard everything. I'll stock yeah. the bunker. I'll do, I'll come up with a list. I'm a list maker. <laughs> I'll come up with a list of what we need to get, and then we can all just hole up in the bunker, and everything will be fine. See, you definitely have skills that that would keep you alive. You could sell these ideas to <laughs> yeah the guards to keep you keep you going. Yeah, maybe. How about you? Question back at you. How would oh, you survive, gosh. or how would you cope? I guess. Yeah. Um, well, similar to you, I think I'm probably short on the survivalist skills. Um, I mean, I've used firearms before, but I don't own one. So I, I you know, if, if I had one and it fell apart, I, I don't know what I would do. To, I don't know if I could put it back together or anything like that. Um, I, I think I would kind of be up shit creek without a paddle, if I can be blunt, in terms of skill sets. Mental health wise, I know this sounds terrible. Um, I think I would find it a little exciting, but scary at the same time. Right. I think the first ten minutes you'd be like, oh, "Wow, I'm in the, I'm in the apocalypse. I'm in a <laughs> right. movie." And right. then you'd like break a bone and be like, "Oh sh shit! Oh fuck! Right. Oh god! Yeah, There's my... no hospitals. What do I do?" <laughs> <laughs> my big concern would be, how do I take care of my children? Mm -hmm. Obviously. Um, <laughs> So maybe going to the grocery store would be the first thing I would try to do before it's completely wiped out. But that would be a very dangerous place. So I, yeah, I, I'm afraid that I would probably have to 
join some other band just to survive, even if I didn't agree with them or with their with their ideals. Like I said, you'd be in an ambush camp or something. Like you would end up. Yeah. I think a lot of us would. It would kind of be luck of the draw. Like, do you end up at Lost Lake? Do you end up at Copeland's? Do you end up in an ambush camp? Like, right. do you end up joining the fucking Rippers or the Anarchists or something? Oh, like you just. Geez. It's whoever you maybe run into it's when deacon saves you from the car where you're stuck <laughs> screaming for help and you're like there's a go? camp where just tell me yeah it's like it's on deacon like does he send you to tucker's that's where oh. you're going that's where you fucking end up <laughs> yeah so so weak and powerless <laughs> i'm trusting yeah. others completely yeah i have to stop this here um i could talk okay. to you all fucking day but we've we've talked for a long time already um this has been an incredible conversation. I, I've had so much fun talking with you. Thank you for, for being on the podcast. Yeah, it was my pleasure. This is this is the most exciting part of my day. So thank <laughs> you for having me. You can support the Days Gone podcast via buymeacoffee.com slash daysgonepod, where you can throw a little money in the tip jar if you're feeling generous. That really helps me with the overhead costs of running the show. You can also support the podcast by simply leaving a review on Spotify or whatever app you listen to us on. Also, subscribe and give us a thumbs up on YouTube. That helps the algorithm do its thing so more people can find the podcast. You can email me your thoughts, comments, opinions, and counter-arguments at daysgonepod at gmail.com. You can also find me moderating the Days Gone subreddit. Thanks for listening. Weaver out. Weaver out.